Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services for Sunday, May the 21st. We'll sing a few songs. We sing from songs of faith and praise here at Northfield. Uh, if you do not have that uh, songbook, uh, you need to Google the song or you have another book, I will give you the name, number, and the title of the song. We will start with number 779. The title of the song is, I Love You, Lord. 779, I Love You, Lord. <clears throat> I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. The next song we will sing is number 678. 678. The title of the song is More Holiness Give Me. Oh, wrong Wrong number. More holiness give me. I have the wrong number here. So let's get the right number. 681. 681. I was only off by three numbers. Pretty good for me. More holiness give me. More holiness give me. More strivings within, more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more gentleness care, more joy in his service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude give me, more trust in the Lord, more bright in his glory, more hope in his word, more tears for his sorrows, more pain at his grief, more meekness and trial, more praise for relief. More purity give me, more strength in your realm, more freedom from earth stains, more longings for home, more fit for the kingdom. More useful I'd be, more blessed, holy, more Savior like Thee. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, number 315, when I survey the wondrous cross. 315. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. When I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> when I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince 
of glory thine, my riches gain, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and blood flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? Or those compulsions so rich a crown. We come to the part of the service where we observe the Lord's Supper. We are instructed to do this on the first day of the week, as Matthew, as Acts chapter 20, verse 7, uh, explains to us on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. That is exactly what we are doing right now. We do this because we survey the wondrous cross of Jesus. We survey the cross on which uh, Jesus died, that uh, his body was racked uh, in pain, that blood flowed from it, the life-giving blood. And so as we look at the Lord's Supper, we see uh, the infinite plan that you had for us, that while we were yet sinners, uh, God sent Jesus to us. And let's keep that in mind as we observe this Lord's Supper. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, you were willing to send your Son to earth. We're so grateful for all that he stood for uh, as a man, but as the Son of God also. And we're uh, so grateful that he was willing to bear the agony of the cross that his body was given in our stead. As we partake of uh, this bread, help us to remember the body that uh, hung on that cross. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. The song says, um, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. We think of the blood that flowed from Jesus's body. And the writer of this song describes it as sorrow and love flow mingled down. The blood that uh, Jesus shed uh, reflected his love for us that he allowed this life-giving blood to flow from his body, that through the blood we may have forgiveness of sins. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. And as Christians, we understand the meaning of that blood. We understand that uh, the life-giving blood that flowed from his body is the blood that washes away our sins. Bless us as we partake. Help us to take our sins to you, knowing that his blood cleanses us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen.
we have completed the Lord's Supper, but also on the first day of the week, we are commanded to give. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 talks about the substances that we have and what we're supposed to do with them. We are told that we are to give as we have prospered. Uh, we remember the widow giving all that she had, uh, just two small coins, but it was representative of what she had. It was representative of the magnitude of her gift. And so as we give, let's give as we have purposed in our heart. Let's remember that we have prospered. And let's remember uh, that God is first in our lives and the monies that we give uh, will be used to further your cause. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to give with an open heart. Help us to give understanding that uh, our gifts are giving you but your own. Help us to understand that we came into this world with nothing. We will leave it with nothing but we will leave our mark on this world. Part of the mark we will leave on this world is involved in the church and uh, the church of which Jesus is the head, the church that uh, goes out into all the world and lets people know the glory of our God and the wonders of his son. Bless us as we give, help us to give prosperously help us to give cheerfully we pray this in his most holy name amen the last song that we'll sing is number 589 589 it's an old song but uh you'll understand this the lesson unfolds uh the meaning of the song <clears throat> while i'm reading at the bottom the song was written in 1887 wow that's 150 years ago leaning on the everlasting arms <clears throat> What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I am blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning. On the everlasting arms. I hope you were able to 
sing with us this evening. I know the Lord was praised uh, as we are supposed to praise the Lord in song. This evening, uh, if you were present this morning, either uh, live or live streaming, uh, I let you know that the uh, title of the lesson uh, this evening is Eternal Perfection. Eternal Perfection. The text of the lesson is the 33rd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. The 33rd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. It reads, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Uh, kind of, uh, uh, the song was kind of a segue into this. It, uh, I was prompted to lead that good old leaning on Jesus song. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Do we ever reflect and think of our condition um, as human beings? You know, we're <laughs> what we might call fragmentary creatures. We we long for the wholeness of life. We don't like to be fragmented. We like to be whole in what we do. And we're driven by a desire to have fulfillment. Now that's true literally in all aspects of our life. We like the work that we have chosen to be fulfilling in our lives. Uh, we like the way that we spend our spare time to fulfill us. But more importantly, we like our belief in our God to be wholly fulfilling. And with that, and remember, the title of my lesson is Eternal Perfection. Our hopes for perfection must not be set on the outcome of our own efforts, but on the completeness of God. Why? Because God is perfect and eternal. And we are striving toward eternal perfection. We won't reach eternal perfection because only one is perfect. Our God is perfection. Our God is eternal. And with that, I believe with all of my heart that God is the goal of our existence. We're all goal setters, aren't we? We, we use goals in our life, uh, uh, hanging up there, um, to strive toward. We strive to reach our goals. And sometimes in life, when we reach our goals, we say to ourselves, I can do better than this. I can reach higher. I can do more. Eternity in God. Eternity, uh, I should say, the eternity of God. It's a little hard to comprehend, isn't it? But when we think about it, I believe it strengthens us. It's hard to comprehend because we're not infinite beings. We're finite beings. We had a beginning at our conception and the finite aspect of our lives are when we take our last breath of life. Then the physical part of our lives are over. However, the eternal God according to the scripture, is our refuge. And underneath 
are the everlasting arms. Look at it. God is our refuge. And he leans down with those everlasting arms. As a, as a hen gathers her chicks to us. God wants to gather us up to him. Why? Because he is our refuge. He is eternal perfection. Now, you know, we are bogged down as human beings. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but we are. We're bogged down in our imperfections, our, our limitations. The limitations are in a temporal world. And we need a hope that's bigger than that. And so we have a God who literally transcends time. We have a God who is eternal. And the, the scriptures present us over and over again with the, I think, the soul-nourishing truth that God had no beginning and will have no end. And it's our goal to spend eternity with our eternal God. Immortal, eternal, and infinite are God's attributes. Do you like those three terms? Immortal, eternal, and infinite. Those are God's greatest attributes. He's, he is able to deal in perfect wisdom in every one of the short-term problems that plague the mortal world. And there are many, aren't they? There, our, our life will always be filled with problems. We, we wake up in the morning and we think of what lies ahead of us. And uh, what lies ahead of us are choices that we will make. But certainly, during the course of the day, we will be faced by a multiplicity of problems. One of the biggest problems is the inevitability of sin. The sinfulness of man. We know that God sent Jesus into a sinful world. Jesus didn't go to sinless people. Why? Because there weren't any. He went into a sinful world. And the, the Jewish leaders of the day were so upset with him because they looked upon themselves as carrying out the law in perfection, which they did not. And Jesus went to the tax collectors. Jesus went to people who they looked down upon. But see, this was Jesus' goal in life. Because we are sinful man. And he is able to deal with that, to with our short-term problems. And those problems plague the mortal world. With that, we have a God. It's not limited by time as we are. That's not limited by space as we are. That's not limited by difficulties of the world that we are. He is a God that we can put our trust in. Now, again, I mentioned this already. We're goal striving creatures. We, we always reach for something in one way, shape, or form. And in moments of our greatest courage, we reach forward. The Apostle Paul said that. He says, not that I have attained it, but I strive daily for the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. He knew as as 
you know, as we look at him as well as he was doing, he hadn't gained it yet. Why? Because he was a goal-seeking human being. Despite the fact that he was Holy Spirit-inspired, he was human. And he was goal-seeking. His goal was to spend eternity with his God. And so when we reach toward God, we're moving along the only path that serves any real promise for each one of us. If it's not in our creator, where else can we find the pieces that are missing from our created nature? See, we, we're, we're kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And in order for uh, us to do jigsaw puzzles, my wife loves to do jigsaw puzzles. All the pieces must fit together perfectly. That's how we try to order our lives. Unfortunately, they don't fit together perfectly. That's where God comes in. And so Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 tells us this. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and all power. Only when we strive and reach for God do we find that power. Do we find the power to get all the pieces to where they're supposed to be? And you know what? Go back to Deuteronomy. It's only his everlasting arms that are strong enough to support them. That's why we sing that song, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms of God. Why? Because God is our refuge and he wants to gather us up to him. And those arms are, in fact, waiting for us. Our, our eternal God waits for us to confess our weaknesses and then come home to him, to strive to live with him eternally. When Jesus said to his disciples, where I'm going right now, you cannot go, but I'm preparing a place for you. He's prepared that place for you and I only if we walk down that path because God is our refuge only if we allow his everlasting arms to grasp us. The story contained in the scriptures is the story of how God made this homecoming possible. That's what the scriptures all point to. They all point to our homecoming. They all point to our eternal life with the Lord. It's the story of an infinite God in whose perfection each of us may find our sustenance and we may find our support. Why? Because God is our refuge and we are underneath his everlasting arms. I would like to close this lesson with some words from the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She said, And I smiled to think God's greatness flowed around our incompleteness, around our restlessness. We're incomplete human beings. We are restless human beings, but don't fear. Don't fear because God is our refuge. He is our hope and he reaches out his everlasting arms to all of us. 
so that we may spend our eternity with him. As flawed human beings, God just asks us to present our sins to him. And the blood of Jesus that we talked about during the Lord's Supper washes away our sins so that we will walk down the path to glory. If you're not a child of God this evening, this is our time of invitation. We invite you to become one of God's children so his everlasting arms will reach down to you, so he will indeed be your refuge. If you know that you need to confess Jesus as the Son of God, to repent of your former lives, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, we offer you that invitation this evening. If that is your need, contact one of us. We will be there for you. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for uh, the time that we have spent together. Any time that we spend together with you in your word is a great time for us. It's a great time because we are fragmented and incomplete people, and you are complete. And you serve as our sustenance to make our way through life and walk down the path toward you. Bless us as we do that, dear Heavenly Father. Bless us as your creatures, uh, as your creation, created in your image, to strive to live godly lives and to do your will so that we will one day live with you. Bless us through this evening. Help us to keep you close in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Amen.